Hi, thank you so much for coming. We're so happy to be here uh, at the Janus Forums event discussing sexual assault on campus. I'm Dana Schwartz. I'm the co-director of the Janus Fellows, a nonpartisan student group through the Political Theory Project committed to the belief that, uh, committed to the idea that no belief should be unchallenged in the hope of promoting intelligent and thoughtful discourse. Again, thank you so much for coming to discuss such an important issue on campus. Here tonight we have Wendy McElroy, who's a speaker and research fellow with the Independent Institute and has written exclusively, I mean extensively, about women, feminism, and politics. Not exclusively, everything. Sorry about that handwriting. Uh, we also have Jessica Valenti, who is the founder of Feministing.com, a columnist for The Guardian, who's written four books about women and feminism today. The format of the debate uh, discussion will be 20 minutes for each speaker to discuss their position on the issue, followed by 40 minutes of question and answer session at each microphone in the aisle. We hope that you will uh, join us and join the conversation. And to further that, we've raffled off two tickets for the dinner afterward. And I'm pleased to announce now that those have gone to Jordana Rosenfeld and Eric Nguyen. So afterward, please see either me Alex Friedland or Peter McClough in the front, the two boys in the suits, and we'll get you your tickets. Uh, thank you again so much for coming. We hope for a constructive and civil discussion for everyone here. Thanks again. Oh. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Wendy McElroy, our first speaker. Thank you and good evening. How many of you came tonight knowing exactly who I am and thinking you know exactly what I'm going to say? I'm an individualist feminist, which is a tradition within individual, within feminism that you may not be tr familiar with. It's also called libertarian feminism. And I'm going to open in an unconventional manner by speaking about my personal background. I've had a great deal of violence in my life. When I was 16, I ran away from home and lived on the street. I was raped, and brutally so. I did not blame the society. I did not blame the culture. I blamed the man who raped me. I've had reason in my life to blame other men. In my 20s, due to a, a, a domestic violence incident, I had a hemorrhage in the central line of vision of my right eye that left me legally blind. I did not blame society. I did not blame culture. I blamed the man who put his fist in my face. Every morning I wake up, I know the pain and the importance of violence against women because I see half of the world because of it. I am bringing this up before I bring up the arguments and the evidence because when a woman like me comes and disagrees with the feminist orthodoxy, what comes back are accusations. I don't know what it means, the significance, the importance of the violence against women. I trivialize rape. Let's put that behind us. Let's say that I am a woman who knows intimately the pain of sexual violence and that I disagree. Let's put that behind us and do the one thing that is most important in this issue, which is actually discuss the issues, raise questions. This evening, I'll address two topics all too briefly, the rape culture, and how I think sexual assault accusations on campus should be treated. So the rape culture. A conflict within feminism about the rape culture came into focus on February 28th of this year when the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, known as RAIN, the largest anti-sexual anti -sexual violence organization in America and, and the most influential and hardly a voice of conservatism. Rain sent a 16-page letter 
to a new White House task force that had the mission of reforming and standardizing campus reform hearings across America. Rain stated, and I quote, there has been an unfortunate trend toward blaming rape culture for the extensive problem of sexual violence on campus. While it is helpful to point out the systemic barriers to addressing the problem, it is important not to lose sight of a simple fact. Rape is caused not by cultural factors, but by the conscious decisions of a small fraction of a community to commit a violent crime. While that may seem an obvious point, it has tended to get lost in recent debates." End quote. Raina argued that focusing on the, quote, rape culture made it harder to stop sexual violence since it removed the focus from the individual at fault and seemingly mitigates personal responsibility for his or her own actions. I agree. The treatment of rape needs to move away from what has become the status quo assumption of feminist orthodoxy, away from rape as an expression of culture, and toward holding a small number of individuals absolutely responsible for their actions. Men or women as a category do not rape. Individuals do. And yet, this idea runs counter to the whole idea and the whole discussion of rape culture. You speak of a rape culture, you're saying that rape is so widely accepted that it is a cultural norm. In short, it is a defining aspect of society. And certainly there are cultures in which that definition fits. There are parts of Afghanistan, for example, where, there, where women are married against their will, they are murdered for men's honor, they are raped, and when they are raped, they are arrested for it, and they're shunned by their family afterward. Now, that's a rape culture, but that is not North America. It doesn't resemble North America. Here, rape is a crime that is severely punished. Even an accusation of sexual harassment can ruin someone's career and their lives. A few days ago, I saw a site that made me just wither inside. A man who had a scientist behind the Rosetta comet landing, Matt Taylor, wept an apology on TV because after the biggest achievement of his life, he basically was hounded because he wore a shirt that a female friend of his had made that showed cartoon superheroines on it and he was made to weep in apology on TV rather than revel in an incredible accomplishment. Who had the power there? Did he have the power there? Feminists came and said that he basically should be excoriated, and he wept on TV. It was a, it was a terrible sight. It was a cruel sight. The messages sent to men today are not that it's okay to rape. It's the opposite. And according to both Rain and the Department of Justice, the rate of rape and sexual assault has decreased by more than half since 1993, so why aren't we celebrating? North America is not a rape culture, and it is an insult to women who live in one that women here, with so much freedom and so much opportunity, are trying to share the same status with them. I often hear statistics meant to prove to me that things are far, far worse for women here than I'm making out. But there's a problem with the statistics used to support a rape culture. Many researchers have tried to find out where they come from, what they're based on, and it is an incredibly hard task. For example, a recently circulated claim is that 8% of college men have either attempted or successfully raped. And I'll be dwelling on this stat for a reason. Some associates and I have tried to track it down. And when it's, it's typical of what happens over and over again 
when people try to track down these stats and, and, and find out where are they based, what are they rooted in. A key reason why I find no evidence for systemic rape culture, only evidence of rapes committed by individuals, is because the, the, the data doesn't exist. We trace the figure back to a book entitled Body Wars by the clinical psychologist Margot Main. Uh, to quote from the book, quote, 8% uh, of college men have either attempted or successfully raped. 30% say they would rape if they could get away with it. When the wording was changed to force a woman to have sex, the number jumped to 58%. Worse still, 83.5% argued that some women look like they are just asking to be raped. End quote. I stumbled when I first read the 83.5% figure because it seemed improbable to, improbable to me that a scientifically based study, first of all, would ask that question, and second of all, that would be the result. And again, I'm a woman who's known an unusual amount of violence. I'm hardly naive on this subject. When the National Post, which is a major Canadian paper, decided to follow up on the questions we were raising, about the stats in Maine's book, a reporter contacted her. She was largely unable to give her sources. There was one study she reported, and to quote the book again, in one study over half of high school boys and nearly half of the girls stated that rape was acceptable if the male was sexually aroused, end quote. No one, including Maine, was able to come up with that study. No one has found it yet. When pressed, Maine emailed the National Post, basically saying she didn't know where it came from, uh, she didn't know why it hadn't been cited, and she was too busy to bother. Well, I'm too busy to bother giving it credibility. And by the way, I, bought, I brought the article, if anyone's interested in the forensics of the attempt to get the stats. Returning to the 8% figure, Maine said it came from another work published in 1988. This was a reference to the extremely influential study conducted by Mary Koss, which was popularized in 1988 through the book, I Never Called It Rape, the Miss Study on Recognizing, Fighting, and Surviving Date and Rape Acquaintance by Robin Warshaw. There are so many problems with the Coase study. For one thing, Coase herself admits that only 27% of the women that she had counted as rape victims considered themselves to have been raped. 49% said the sexual encounter in question had been the result of miscommunication, not rape. Coase ignored the voices of these women and redefined their experiences to fit her own studies. And that's a problem. If you don't find that to be a problem, then I find it to be a problem you call yourself a feminist. Again, I've dwelled on tracking down the 8% stat because it's a key reason feminists like me reject the rape culture. It's because you look at the stats, you look at the data, it's extremely biased, it's badly flawed, or it is not there. And perhaps the factual weakness is a reason why the rhetoric surrounding a rape culture is so hyperbolic. I even find the term rape culture to be hyperbolic. It seems to prevent the productive dialogue that includes healthy questioning. And that's a shame because as a rape survivor, and like I said, I've gone through hell with a lot of violence in my life. As a survivor, I want to know the truth about sexual assault in our society. I don't want politics. I don't want ideology. I want the truth. And I want it for a simple reason. Rape is a hideous crime and it is never going to be deterred until we deal with its reality, not its politics, but it's reality. I'll move on now and focus on how I believe universities should handle accusations of rape. But one thing I'm not going to discuss 
at least not in my talk, uh, certainly in Q&A, are the stats on how many rapes or how many false accusations occur. And again, there's a simple reason. If even one rape occurs, it raises exactly the same question as if 100 rapes occur. And that's how do we handle it. If even one false accusation occurs, it raises exactly the same question as if 100 occur. How do we handle it? How do we prevent an innocent person, almost certainly a man, from becoming a victim? So what's the best way to ensure a rape victim receives justice? My answer, which is simplistic and unsatisfying to both me and to you, it's a criminal offense. Go to the police. Rape is a crime. It's, it's, not, it's not an infraction of, co of college policy. They're trained to investigate and process it, and they usually, often, maybe, they do a piss poor job. I don't argue with that. But I think they do a better job than bureaucrats, academics, many of whom are ideologically biased and under federal marching orders not to use criminal or exacting standards of investigation. And I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. If students want to make a difference in the justice with which rape victims are treated, then you should be protesting at police departments and outside courtrooms. If you did that and you changed the efficiency or the attitude with which law enforcement approached rape, then you wouldn't be helping just yourselves. You'd be helping every woman in America. Every woman would be in your debt. But that's not going to happen. Because there is an extreme political push behind campus hearings. Arguably, the push began in April 2011 when the Department of Education informed campuses that they needed to comply with new standards for adjudicating sexual assault if they wanted to receive federal funding, and everyone does. Even private universities are under great pressure to conform to what's becoming the standard on all campuses. The new standard deprives an accused of legal protections, such as the presence of counsel and the right to cross-examine an accuser. The criminal standard of beyond a reasonable doubt, which was used to ascertain guilt, was scrapped in favor of the civil standard of a preponderance of the evidence. And that means that hearing officials are 50.1% convinced that one side is more likely to be true than the other. In other words, a student can be found guilty of rape by the same standard of evidence that traffic courts use to adjudicate parking tickets. The federal pressure on campuses continues on September 3rd, NPR reported, quote, more than 70 campuses are under federal investigation for violating the civil rights of alleged victims. And some students say schools are running so scared that they're violating the due process rights of defendants instead, end quote. Earlier this month, the Department of Education accused Princeton of violating anti-discrimination laws because the university was one of the last holdouts on, re on reducing the standard of proof in rape hearings. In the settlement, they caved, as, as of course they, they would have to. They lowered their standards. The conflict is heating up on both sides. The organization of Voice for Male Students recently issued, listed 42 lawsuits brought by students against universities for violating their rights in hearings. The real figure is closer to, to 50. And there will be more. And there will be a Supreme Court challenge. Believe me. A common response to such criticism is that the hearings are not legal proceedings. And although this is technically true, I find it disingenuous. The hearings 
actually operate in a legal gray zone. For example, the most recent federal instructions on how to conduct hearings include improved cooperation with the police. What this means, I don't know. No one does yet. It comes from the uh, new White House task force that was formed in January. Moreover, the testimony an accused gives at a hearing can be turned over to the police and can be used against him in court, even though he has no legal representation, he has no due process, he has no ability to truly defend himself, for example, by asking questions of his accuser. The so-called non-legal hearings can impose penalties as draconian as any court. A student can be expelled with the word rapist permanently in his file, tens of thousands of dollars in debt. He may have no prospect of getting a license for a lawyer, being a lawyer, a doctor, whatever he, he dreamed of. He is effectively barred from many other unlicensed professions. What university of quality is going to accept him? His reputation is destroyed. And having spoken to some of the men who are bringing lawsuits against universities, I know the extraordinary pain they go through then and now, and will probably live with the rest of their lives. And yet, for the sake of argument, let me grant that hearings are not legal proceedings and then shift ground. The fact that an adjudication is not legal does not release it or the people involved in it from the moral and the professional responsibility to be fair. There is what you legally must do, and then there is common decency. Common decency is a debt that you owe to every other human being, whether they are male or female, whether they are black or white, whether they are gay or otherwise. It is especially important when you are exercising power over the lives of other human beings. And a basic tenet of fairness is that you do not condemn or punish a person without objectively weighing evidence and allowing them to defend themselves. I said I wasn't going to comment on false accusations, uh, not the stats but I need to comment on the existence of false accusations. If not their frequency, then their existence. Please finish your thought. People lie. Men lie. Women lie. Feminists lie. Yesterday, I read about the drunken video that was meant to dramatize the rape culture. The video went viral, and it showed a supposedly drunk young woman asking various men for assistance the men made sexual suggestions instead. Then the LA Weekler revealed that the men had been paid, their lines had been scripted. It was a hoax. People lie, men lie, women lie, feminists lie. Do not build justice for women on injustice for men. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, Jessica Valenti. Hi. Thanks for having me. Can we have a round of applause for Dana, please, and the great job she's doing? I also want to say thanks to Wendy for sharing her personal story. I think that's always incredibly difficult, and we should be respectful of that. Um, I'm so grateful to be here, um, but I did want to start by saying that as happy as I am to have this opportunity to speak about this issue, um, I think, like a lot of people, I'm exhausted of having to talk about rape culture in a framework that assumes its existence is up for debate. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, that said, I want to I start by telling you a story about an amazing woman that you may have heard of called Emma Sulkowitz. Anyone heard of Emma? OK, so, oh, a lot of you. Excellent. OK, so in 2013, Emma, who is a student at Columbia University, reported being raped to her school. 
At first, she didn't want anyone to know, but when she met two other students who said they'd been assaulted by the same man who attacked her, a man who was also a student, she decided to report. In addition to telling her school, she also later filed a police report in which she described, and I'm sorry, trigger warning to those of you who might find this upsetting, um, she filed a police report in which she described being hit and choked during the attack, um, as well as being anally penetrated, all without consent. Emma told me uh, and other reporters how terribly the university handled her case. They didn't take complete notes. They demanded she not the, uh, discuss the case with anyone. And during the disciplinary panel, one of the experts who was put on the panel didn't actually believe that anal sex could physically happen without lubricant. Um, so they just, they didn't believe it at all. So at the end, the panel found her attacker not responsible, um, and Emma said that she felt like a shell of a human being. While this was all happening, students were debating Emma's story on the Columbia Student Newspaper site, talking about whether she was lying, and as you can imagine, some of the things that were said um, were just horrible. When Emma went to the police later to file a report, her friends who were there with her were told by a police officer that, quote, of all these cases, 90% are bullshit, so I don't believe your friend for a second. Now, this is just one story, um, though I'm not done talking about Emma. But before I go on, um, I wanted to share a quote with you from my friend Thomas Macaulay Millar, a terrific writer who contributed uh, to the anthology Yes Means Yes that I edited um, with, with Jacqueline Friedman. Thomas once wrote that it takes one rapist to commit a rape, but it takes a village to create an environment where it happens over and over and over. And that's what rape culture is, right? The environment that allows rape to happen over and over. Um, I can't scratch the surface of rape culture on college campuses in 20 minutes. And again, I'm not going to try to convince anyone that rape culture exists uh, because I don't have to. The facts speak for themselves. According to the Department of Justice, someone is sexually assaulted in the United States every two minutes. According to the CDC, 20% of college women will be victims of a rape or an attempted rape before they leave school. We also know that the more marginalized someone is, the more likely they are to be attacked. Women of color, the LGBT community, native women, immigrant women, disabled and poor women are assaulted at disproportionate rates. But at the end of the day, this is not a problem of numbers. This is about the environment we create that allows rape to thrive by giving rapists social license to operate. And this is something that Millar writes about as well. Social license to operate means all the various ways in which we make the world a little bit more comfortable for rapists. And we see examples of this every day. We live in a country where a Texas defense lawyer called an 11-year-old gang rape victim a spider luring men into her web. Where the New York Times, when writing about this same 11-year-old, a young girl of color, felt the need to print that she, quote, dressed older than her age and wore makeup as if that had anything to do with a group of grown men deciding to assault her. We live in a country where instead of helping a sexual assault victim, students in Steubenville, Ohio, joked about the crime and took pictures. Where women are still told that if they just didn't wear that skirt, have that beer, walk down that street, they'd be safe. We live in a world where teenagers who have been raped, young women like Retea Parsons and Audrey Pott, are so ashamed over the abuse they endured, being called whores, having pictures of the attack sent around social media that they chose to end their lives rather than take another minute of it. This is happening now, this is happening every day, and this is happening in a culture that purports to believe rape is wrong while doing very little to stop it. Yes, we have laws against rape, but they aren't protecting us. Only 3% of rapists go to jail, and the criminal justice system still largely disbelieves women or makes it impossible for them to get justice. In 2006, a Nebraska judge ordered that the victim in a rape trial not be allowed to use the word rape or sexual assault when describing what happened to her because it would be too prejudicial. Can you imagine a judge telling a mugging victim that he's not allowed to use the word robbery? Up until 2008, it wasn't considered rape in Maryland if a, woman, if a woman withdrew her consent, and just a woman, by the way, this law, it wasn't considered rape in Maryland if a woman withdrew her consent during sex and her partner kept going. It defies not just morality, but common sense. Who else continues to have sex with an unwilling partner besides a rapist? In 2012, in Oregon, a woman who was raped, beaten, and choked by a man she went on a date with was ordered to provide her Google search history. The defense team hoped that if she had Googled the definition of rape, 
It would show that she wasn't sure if she had been really sexually assaulted. Every one of these cases dealt with within the system that is meant to protect rape victims gave rapists a social license to operate. So did the lack of experts on Emma's disciplinary school panel. So do college sports teams when they rally around men accused of sexual assaults. So do schools when they do nothing about fraternities that students nickname rape factories, as one fraternity at Wesleyan was called. And just like systemic inequality, discrimination, and entitlement, this social license to operate is foundational to rape culture. So what does it look like if we start to chip away at rapists' social license to operate? Is it possible? The truth is that we have opportunities to intervene every day, whether it's stopping someone when they're telling a rape joke or saying they got raped by a test, or holding your university accountable for their Title IX and Clery Act obligations. Sometimes intervening in rape culture can be done within the system. You can work with your school to implement a yes means yes policy and orientation, and I know that there's a yes means yes or an affirmative consent policy here at Brown, which I'd love to hear more about in Q&A. Um, or you can make sure that there are appropriate resources for sexual violence services. Other times, intervening in rape culture can be done in less traditional ways. When their schools weren't doing enough about rape, some students at Columbia and Barnard started writing the names of their rapists on the school walls. Um, and while I can't officially suggest that you uh, vandalize school property, I'm, I'm not against radical action, I will say, <laughs> when it comes to this issue. Uh, for, for Emma, that's my thumbs up. Yay. For Emma, her intervention meant publicly shaming her university and her attacker through what I think is a really incredible art project. When Emma started the semester this past September, she decided to carry an extra long twin size mattress across school to every class every day until her rapist moves off campus. Emma told me when I wrote about this, I was raped in my own bed. I could have taken my pillow, but I want people to see how it weighs down a person to be ignored by the school administration and harassed by police. So in addition to joining a federal complaint over her school's mishandling of her case, she's lifting that mattress above her head, above her head every day so that anyone who sees her remembers what happens to her and the shame of the school. She, sends, she says the piece will only end if her attacker leaves campus or if the administration expels him. And she calls it an endurance piece, which I think is um, quite accurate. When I first interviewed Emma about this art piece, which is called Carry That Weight, um, what struck me were these pictures of her walking around campus alone with the mattress. I'm just going to pull one up. And it really struck me and, and when she first started doing this, and it made me think about the lack of social support uh, that there is for victims. Too often, instead of believing women and listening to their stories, we pull the wool further over our eyes, both because that's the easier thing to do, because it supports traditional power structures, and because in some way I think it makes us feel safe. When we say that someone could have, avo could have avoided rape by not wearing a skirt or not getting drunk, what we're really saying is this does not happen to good, smart people. What we're really saying is this could not happen to me. But I think the most prevalent way that victims are being blamed right now on college campuses is through the way that authorities, the media, um, and rape experts, a lot of pundits right now, claim that alcohol is really the problem. It's alcohol that's the problem. Alcohol is not the problem. <laughs> yes, there should be a conversation about the relationship between rape and drinking. But what we need to discuss is the way that rapists use alcohol as a weapon to attack and then discredit their victims. But focusing on rapists is not nearly as popular as scolding young women. This past Sunday, the New York Times ran an op-ed on the front page of their Sunday review section on college rape. The author, uh, a Yale professor, wrote that we need to stop being foolish about booze on campus and that, quote, a vast majority of college women's rape claims involve alcohol. The truth, a vast majority of rapists attack women, attack drunk women. We need to center the perpetrator's behavior, not the victim's behavior. Rapists deliberately and with forethought, and this has been researched out, lots of studies on this, rapists deliberately use alcohol as a weapon in their assaults. They do this because they know that women are less likely to be believed if they've been drinking. So they depend on our culture's continued insistence that alcohol-facilitated rape is a misunderstanding. That's what helps them get away with their attacks. We're helping them get away with their attacks. So how can we stop helping them? Part of removing the social license to operate is debunking um, the myths around rape and rape culture. Uh, so just a few, and there are a lot. 
and I couldn't even begin to <laughs> get into them. Uh, rape culture does not mean believing that all men are rapists, right? We know that's absolutely not true. The most recent research um, on college rape from David Lissack, which is great, and you all should look it up, shows that only four to six percent of college men rape. It's a very, very small percent. Um, the problem, I mean, that's a problem on its own, obviously, but they commit an average of six rapes during their time at school. So it happens over and over and over again. They get away with it again and again and again. Rape culture does not mean believing that our culture explicitly condones rape. It doesn't. We have laws against rape, though as I pointed out, they're largely ineffective. And for the most part, we're taught that rape is wrong. But knowing that rape is wrong doesn't mean anything if people don't understand what rape is. In Steubenville, and I imagine a lot of you followed the, the Steubenville case, um, one, one witness in the Steubenville case was asked why he didn't stop the assaults um, when he saw it. He walked in on the assaults, and, and he was asked, why didn't you stop this um, sexual assault? He testified he, di he didn't know that the attack was rape. Quote, it wasn't violent. I thought rape was forcing yourself on someone. Earlier that evening, this same teen boy took car keys away from a drunk friend. At some point, he got the cultural message that drunk driving is wrong, but never that penetrating an unconscious girl is rape. There's a reason that people use qualifiers when they talk about rape, like date rape, legitimate rape, right, it's hot again, uh, forcible rape, gray rape is another one. Saying rape, just simply saying rape, is not enough. We want to know what kind of assault it is in order to make a value judgment about what really happened. But for us to change the culture, we need to do more than debunk myths. We need to fundamentally shift the way we think about gender, power, sex, and consent. And I'm really glad to see that students are starting to do this um, already, in part through Yes Means Yes initiatives, whether it's policies or orientations on campus, and that legislators are starting to take them seriously. Because there's nothing radical about saying you should only have sex with people who actively want to have sex with you. Thanks. <laughs> there's nothing difficult or controversial about consent meaning the presence of an enthusiastic yes rather than the absence of a no. It's a model that imagines women as sexual actors rather than assuming our default answer to sex is yes unless otherwise stated, um, which is what no means no does right now, right? All that said, uh, I know that this change will not come easily. I know that we have our work cut out for us. Um, and I know that what is happening on campus and nationwide is extremely disheartening and very difficult. Uh, but I do believe that we're up for it. And when I start to feel down, and this is hard work to do when you've been doing this work for a long time, it's very emotionally draining. Um, when I start to feel down about how much work still has to be done and just how hard it is to care about and work on this issue, I think about Emma and I think about what happened a couple of days into her project. Without asking for their help, people in the Columbia and New York community started to help Emma carry that weight. They organized shifts, they walked around campus with her, and they supported her. So despite the hurdles, I want to say, and I just want to leave you with the idea that I do believe in our capacity for change. I do believe in our innate goodness. And I know that if we take on a little bit of this huge weight individually, if we all agree to carry our share, we can turn the tide. Thank you.